When we think about understanding early hominins, we really have to compare ourselves to our closest living relatives, the chimpanzees and bonobos. And when I thought about who's studying wild chimpanzees in a really interesting ecological context, I wanted to talk to Jill Preetz. Jill is the Walvoord Professor of Liberal Arts and Sciences at Iowa State University in Ames, Iowa. She is working with chimpanzees for many years in Senegal, the westernmost part of the chimpanzee range, at a site called Fongoli. Her chimpanzees, as opposed to most wild chimpanzees, are living in a really unique environment. They're living in a savanna context. They're dealing with some of the ancient environments that our ancient ancestors also were inhabiting. And those chimpanzees exhibit some really unique behaviors compared to other wild chimpanzees. She's going to talk about their hunting behavior, about some of the aspects of their social interactions, and about the way that they use different parts of the landscape as part of their lifestyle. Jill has visited us here in Madison a couple of times. I caught up with her at the meetings of the American Association of Physical Anthropology. Still experimenting with the setup, but basically oh. I'm working on the most portable possible kit to do a two right. camera setup interview. Oh, that's pretty portable. <laughs> There we go. Now that's recording. This is recording. That's recording. Perfect. We're all set. Okay. Okay. <laughs> you know, Fongoli is a really interesting site because it has this savanna environment that when you began was somewhere that nobody had really done field observations of chimps before. Right. Um, and that's, I mean, that's why I, I chose the site. Mm -hmm. And um, it was difficult at the beginning because no one had habituated savanna chimps. So that was the that was the issue: is that there had been some studies of nesting behavior and diet and that sort of thing, but no one had habituated them. So it was really difficult for me to get funding. Uh -huh. uh, I knew I could habituate them. It was just a matter of time, basically, because I don't like to give up. But uh, so it took us about four years to, to habituate them. And I think ba basically the key is that they live alongside people in this, mm -hmm. this area that I chose. And so they're used to humans as part of their, their life, their landscape. So that was key. It still took a long time. But I also, you know, chose them specifically because of the savanna, but I was interested in certain questions. I'm still interested in those questions, but then, the behaviors that began to emerge were, I mean, I never could predict some of the behaviors they did. And so then I would shift to focus on those. So it's been great. I, I, it's been fun and intellectually stimulating because I have to broaden my, my interest. But yeah, I, it's, it's everything that I, that I hoped it would be when I, when I started, but it was difficult to start. That's for sure. One of the points that, <laughs> that I think that you make really well is how interdisciplinary it, it now is, you know, it's, it's not just, one person out in the field watching chimpanzees. You are working with so many different kinds of people to examine not only you know the record of their behavior, but also secondarily the, the products that they make, um, the the nutritional content of the foods that they're eating. I mean, could you describe a little bit how that works? Yeah, I mean the the collaboration for me is is key. I just in in part I can't do it all. Yeah, and so that was you know that's one of the things. So I I have students. I one of my favorite things to do is mentor grad students. I sort of live vicariously through their projects because I I can't do all the projects myself, and so I enjoy that. But then it does help me immensely because there's mm -hmm. there's no way I could do it all. Um, and then to have I usually. I, I've, I've had it pretty easy, I have to say, is I, I've had people contact me about various things like looking at the tools, sure. um, doing isotopic studies, looking mm -hmm. at uh, just different aspects of the dentition, that sort of thing. So that's been great. And it's it's pretty, I, I'd say easy, but it is fairly easy for me to get um, give access to some of these mm -hmm. uh, to some of these scientists to things like casts of teeth, etc. But to me, it's a great addition to my project because it provides, a bit of evidence that obviously I wouldn't be doing, but it fits mm -hmm. in and tells a bigger story. I think that's key is it completes the story rather than just looking at my aspect of behavioral ecology, which is observational. Mm -hmm. It really adds to it. So yeah, I'm, I'm all about collaboration. And I mean, sadly, I, I do have to limit in terms of the number of collaborators I have on site. I do have to limit sure. that only because mm -hmm. of my restrictions uh, for the chimps because I try to be as, as uh, non-invasive as possible, which, which you know, is, is just part of the whole story. So you mentioned some of the really interesting, unique behaviors that you were observing. And could you, what is the coolest thing? You know, what really surprised you? 
I think that what surprised me the most is probably not the coolest thing for most people, and that's uh -huh. that they use water. Yeah. And they soak in water because for people that study chimps, that's just bizarre. Because uh -huh. for a long time, we thought chimps were hydrophobic even, based on Gombe chimp behavior, mm -hmm. afraid of water. So that, to me, is, is exciting and just odd. And But, I mean, as a human, you can relate to it completely. It's so horribly hot there much of yeah, the year yeah. and so they use waters as part of their thermoregulatory behavior but the hunting with tools is probably what most people find exciting I still find that very exciting and we've seen it over 230 times now but it's, it's still exciting to me I'm interested in individual behaviors and so looking at learning and, and how infants of, of individuals that hunt a lot mm -hmm. behave but that has probably been technically most exciting for for your average person, I we guess. Just, just to you know, sort of inform people. So mm -hmm. at we know have known for a long time that chimpanzees hunt. Um, that meat is a, a a relatively small but important part of their diet. Um, but at most other chimpanzee field sites, it's really male biased. Right. In terms of who's hunting and who's getting the meat. Mm -hmm. And at your site, it was it was different. Yeah, what we found was that not only do they use tools to hunt, so mm -hmm. that's something that's pretty, I won't say unique, that's been seen a few times, but it's systematic at my site. So yeah. they use tools to hunt. They make this long stick tool branch, and they, mm -hmm. they hunt bush babies. So that's yeah. also different because yeah. most chimps ignore bush babies. Yeah. But so they hunt bush babies in these cavities, but it's in fact the females that do this type of hunting more than the males. Yeah. So in some aspects, the males, they're typical, and the males chase down monkeys, but females hunt with tools more. And really it's um, the the younger subadult females that are driving this behavior. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're getting together a paper now on meat sharing. Mm -hmm. And to get to that point, we look just at successful hunters. And in fact, out of the top um, 11 hunters, you had about six females. And so that's just odd for chimps, yeah. really. I yeah. hate to say odd, but it's typical for our, for Fongoli, but it's just not the norm with chimpanzees where most males hunt. And then the other thing that we're focusing on now is sharing or food transfer. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons I think that females are seen to hunt less at other sites is that the prey is usually taken from them mm -hmm. when they get the the prey. And that's not the case at Fungoli either. So there's this male tolerance. So it's really interesting. That's something that I've I've become, you know, more interested in, obviously. Sure. And and so it's a different sort of picture. When we talk about sharing, you know, a lot of a lot of models of human evolution involve the importance of food sharing. And also we think about things like empathy. And you know, from your field site, there are such tremendous examples of the way that chimpanzees are, are you know, I would say empathetic toward each other. Mm -hmm. There's definitely interesting examples of empathy, and one that sort of, I, I don't know if I'd say off the wall, but it was a different type of, of mm -hmm. example. It was actually, sadly, an infant had been taken by poachers at, at our site, and mm -hmm. Miraculously, I'd even say we were able to confiscate her and then put her back in the group within five days. Yeah. And when that happened, the mother accepted her, but the first individual that came and actually retrieved her from where we put her down on the ground was an adolescent male. He retrieved the, the baby, he carried her to the mother. The mother had been injured, and so she couldn't keep up with the group for several days. Mm -hmm. um, so she would stop, put the baby down, and that adolescent male actually helped her carry that infant for the those days and you know as far as we know he's not maternally related he's probably not the father he was too young so it's it's interesting and ultimately whatever the explanation is he showed what we would call empathy if it, yeah. it were human yeah. so that to me was just a, a pretty you know obvious example but even so when you look at their individual relationships there's different types of um, behaviors that you might expect if it's a typical chimp. Yeah. And I think, you know, we, we come to realize that chimps are, are different, but we still have that. I think as humans, we like to dichotomize and we like to categorize and we still see chimps as behaving, you know, in one certain way, but we definitely see some differences and it may relate to something like mating strategy. It could be that, but mm -hmm. at least, and on one level, it does seem to be a different type of behavior yeah. and definitely empathy plays into it. I'd say. Okay. In the sort of more dense, forested environments where a lot of chimpanzees live, um, you, you know, the population density is higher and there is, there are a lot of recorded instances of aggression between groups and, and there's, you know, patrolling of the borders of groups and stuff. How does that play out in your environment? So I've been studying the chimps for almost a dozen years mm -hmm. now, and we haven't seen any lethal aggression. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the home range of the fungally chimps, you wouldn't predict it, yeah. um, theoretically, because 
their home range is around, we know at least 86 square kilometers, 86 square kilometers. Mm -hmm. And if you look at a place like Gombe, for example, in Tanzania, where Jane Goodall worked, it's eight square kilometers. Yeah. So if you think about trying to patrol a big area like that, it doesn't make sense energetically, et cetera. And we have seen intergroup interactions. We haven't seen them, I'd say we've heard them. We're on the tail end, and uh -huh. we probably win those, our group, because the other chimps aren't habituated. But we haven't seen lethal aggression. Um, we've seen aggression within a group, so in many ways they're very similar. Yeah. But we haven't seen that lethal aggression. And in fact, um, in West African chimps, it seems to be pretty rare. And the more I say the Fungoli chimps, obviously I recognize that there are differences because of the savanna, but I also feel like we've we've defined chimps according to this East African chimpanzee model, and I think that West African chimps really do differ. There are different subspecies. Some people say should be a different species. So mm -hmm. I, I keep seeing more and more cases that sort of reinforce that. So that's that's something that I'm pursuing as well, but you know, we need bigger sample size, as is always the case. Yeah, yeah. Um, what would you say is, you know, if you were gonna say to students, what are the top three things that, that that your chimps or chimps generally tell us that are important for understanding human evolution. I mean, the important thing is that you, you know, it's not that humans stand alone. Right, yeah. In any of these behavioral characteristics, mm -hmm. we do things that are within the behavioral range in many right, ways, yeah. like primates. Um, and, and the cool thing about your stuff is, of course, that, you know, you're, you're showing the range of variation in primate behaviors right, exactly, in yeah. this environment, people classically have said, well, this is the, this is the hominid environment. Right, and right. chimpanzees are doing exactly. great there. Yeah, I mean, they seem to be doing, and I was very, when I started my project, I was very conservative. Uh -huh. I was thinking, these, these guys must be so stressed. It's such a harsh environment. For me, it's very harsh. Uh -huh. It's incredibly hot at certain times of the year. Um, and they are stressed, and they have some really interesting ways of dealing with these stresses. Yeah. But, you know, they seem to be doing okay. They're at low densities. That's the case for savanna chimps in general. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, like, like you say, I I, uh, I like the fact that we continue to redefine humans. And yeah. I'm looking at it from a chimp perspective. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I think that's that's where we... That's that's one of my contributions, I like to think, is that we redefine humans, but also chimps. I think that that, yeah. that we need to keep thinking about what a chimp is and what it isn't. What got you started? <laughs> How uh, did you start on this? I uh, it was it's a it's sort of a long convoluted path, but mm -hmm. as far as chimps go, I volunteered with chimps in Texas, where I'm from, at mm -hmm. a facility. I actually, in grad, and as an undergrad, I decided I didn't want to study chimps because everybody wants to study chimps, and I was interested in some other monkey species that I worked with briefly, tamarins, for example. And um, but once I volunteered with chimps, it sort of ruined me. So I was mm -hmm. very, I was just, um, I was. Uh, very surprised, almost shocked at how similar they were in terms of some emotions to humans. And so I was very interested in understanding them. I feel like I'm, I understand chumps some, to some degree, but there's so much more that I don't understand. I don't know if anybody does, yeah. maybe Jenk at all. But, um, <laughs> You know, so I, I, I was just, I sort of was sold on chimps. It ruined me, I'd say, for the rest of the, <laughs> the, the non-human primate world. So that's how I came to be interested in chimps. Uh -huh. I studied different primates for my dissertation, yeah. but I knew that it, ultimately I wanted to start my own field site and study chimps. Cool. Um, as far as getting even into anthropology, I took a, an elective, uh -huh. and I thought, this is this is awesome. I can't believe people do this for a living and get paid for it. Not that they get paid a lot, you know, or it's yeah. easy to find a job. I didn't care at that time. Uh -huh. And uh, I just kept taking more electives. I was actually interested in archaeology and I did some field work. Loved field work, but was less interested in lab work yeah. with archaeology. And, um, you know, primates was sort of my second love as far as anthropology goes. And so I just kind of pursued that and... and and yeah, I knew I wanted to do primatology. I wanted to do it in the field. And, and that's so great. That's, yeah. If you were going to make suggestions to somebody who's a young person who's sort of you know become interested in this, what would you say that they should do to get started? I'd say experience and volunteer. Mm -hmm. You're probably going to have to volunteer. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's key. And when I look at grad students, I you know of course look at how well they've done and mm -hmm. schoolwork, et cetera. But experience to me is key, especially if they want to go to the field. They really need to get experience, even just you know in a different country in a different culture um so i'd say that really is key especially it's very competitive it's much more competitive than it was when i was a 
a graduate student yes. and I think that that's key and it lets mm -hmm. you know what you want to do and yeah. maybe you do want to pursue that maybe you don't okay that's great no that's <laughs> awesome uh, you did just great okay. and, and yeah. thank you so much oh, for, yeah. well, for doing this and uh, and great yeah <laughs> awesome.